All right, well, we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm so excited for this briefing. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our briefing, Funding Opportunities for Nonprofits, Municipalities, and Communities. I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And this is the latest briefing in our series called IRA and IIJA Progress Report. I'd like to start uh, as well by thanking Senator Peter Welch and his great staff for help with the room today. Really couldn't do it without having a place to do it. Um, EESI is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. That's 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education. In fact, last Wednesday, we had a really big party, actually, in the Library of Congress. We had hundreds of people show up celebrating 40 years of EESI. We were founded by a bipartisan group of members of Congress, and since 1984, we've worked to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. And one of our original founders, actually, who created even the conference that predated ESI, Dick Ottinger, who's a former representative from New York, was also with us last week, and he's still on our board of directors. So we've come a lot of we've come a long way in 40 years, but you know, Dick has been a big part of it every step of the way, and there's a lot more work to do. And that's why we continue to provide timely, relevant, accessible, and practical resources. We put a lot of thought into what we do to always be science-based and ready when congressional staff need the information. What does that look like? It looks like a lot of briefings, budget and appropriations, the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook briefing. We do briefings like this where we do deep dives on IIJA and IRA progress. Uh, we do uh, just uh, last, no, two weeks ago, excuse me, we did a briefing with Senator Bennett's office on carbon dioxide removal. We did one back in May on dam removal. We do a lot of nature-based solutions. Uh, and we have even more to come. And one special highlight is we'll do a three-part briefing series in October, or COPtober, about what Congress needs to know about COP29. Thank you for the laughs. I get a lot of eye rolls internally when I say that, but it's nice to know that somebody is out there. Um, our new Healthy and Resil Resilient River Communities Briefing Series will start on October 8th in this very room with a briefing about the Mississippi River, and we'll have lunch that day too, because it's at noon. Everything is always available online at www.eesi.org. And Climate Change Solutions is our bi-weekly newsletter. The last issue came out on Tuesday. When you visit us online, take a moment and sign up. It's a great way to stay in the loop with everything that we're up to. The Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act have opened up new doors for nonprofits and local governments working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate impacts. And our panelists will discuss grant, grant programs for st uh, schools and community organizations, as well as so-called direct pay, which allows tax-exempt entities to access the benefits of federal clean energy tax credits for the first time. These are game-changing investments and incentives. And as the IRA and IAJA programs are fully implemented, these investments will strengthen the local governments and nonprofits that communities rely on. Before I introduce our first panelist, I'd just like to ask everyone to take a quick moment take our survey. We'll have another slide of this at the end, uh, but if you don't think you'll be able to stick around, uh, you can use this QR code or go to esi.org forward slash survey. We read every response. If you have any feedback about our programming, we really, really appreciate it. Um, we'll also have some time for Q&A after our fourth presenter. And for our online audience, you can submit questions by emailing us. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at esi.org. You can also tweet us online, at ESI online. We'll be following us. Uh, we'll be uh, doing real-time coverage on our Instagram story and X. And of course, we'll have lots of time for questions in the room. That brings us to our first speaker today. Michael Forrester is a senior advisor within the Department of, Energy, Department of Energy's Office of State and Community Energy Programs. SCEP is uh, a really tremendous organization. And um, we also have some other folks from SCEP here as well uh, doing great work. Previously, Michael was the Assistant Director of Partnerships working on program design and implementation of the $8.8 .8 billion home energy rebate program funded by the IRA. Michael is the former director of Cincinnati's Office of Environmental Sustainability. And while at the off, um, city of Cincinnati, Michael led projects that improved energy efficiency, provided power, uh, in municipal buildings, installed 100 megawatts solar power that provides power for a city, I don't know why I can't read today, uh, city facilities in the community. Uh, no, you deserve all of this, and you increased electric vehicle use and charging and delivered impactful community projects. I'll have to stop at CVS on my way home and start trying on some, some reading glasses. Michael, thank you for joining us today. It's always great to have DOE featured in our briefings, and I'll turn it over to you.
All righty. Well, thank you much, everyone. Thank you much. Really want to go ahead and make sure that I give a, a shout out to EESI for this opportunity to come and talk about uh, SCEP as a whole. Um, and also talk about, uh, to take a little bit deeper dive here into our schools and nonprofit programs. Um, my name's Michael Forster, as, as the, the long bio said. I'm a senior advisor here um, in SCEP. So what is SCEP? So really quickly, I mean, SCEP is our state and community energy program office. And as the name says, uh, we focus on bringing capacity, funding, resources, technical assistance to our states, our tribes, and our local communities. Our overall impact is significant. We have approximately $16 billion to invest in these various entities, and really we're focused on deploying this in where people live. We're focused on catalyzing local economies. We're focused on investing in clean energy technologies. We're focused on building capacity, and we're all doing this through a Justice 40 lens, where we're making sure that 40% of our overall investments benefit our historic and disadvantaged communities. Um, what does this mean? This means we impact people. This means we impact their bills. This means we impact their schools. This means we impact their communities. We offer job opportunities, we offer economic opportunities, we offer bill savings opportunities. We try very hard to meet people where they live. All said and done, we're a collective of approximately 28 different programs that are administered through a lot of different ways. We have our annual formula, formula appropriations. Thank you, Congress. We have our uh, infrastructure bill appropriations. Thank you, Congress. And we have our um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, provisions. Thank you, Congress. So the combination of all of these programs total approximately $16 billion. So these budget bubbles that we're looking at here just represent a few of our programs, and I'm going to call out a couple of them. So we manage our weatherization assistance program where we upgrade low-income individuals' homes. Um, through, the, uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure bill, our annual appropriation was plussed up 10, 10 times. Um, that allows us, instead of doing approximately 32 to 35,000 houses, we're doing 320 to 350,000 houses that will be weatherized. We've, uh, we, we manage our state energy programs where we help fund state energy offices so the states can really um, can, can, can develop and implement their own programs based on their own priorities. We, will, we manage our home energy rebate program, um, which we're starting to see roll out right now across the country. Um, and we also manage our schools and nonprofits, which we're going to take a little bit deep dive into um, it, he, here in a little bit. Um, the bottom line is, is that you know, through all of these multiple funding sources, SCEP has worked very hard to make them available. Of the $16 billion, we only have one last round of funding for schools and then everything will have been on the streets. Everything is available. Now, it means they're in different places. You know, some of it is just available. Some of it is in, um, is in financial review, and some of it has been obligated. But all of the funds that, that has, has, has been to almost 99.9% .9 of the funds that has been delivered to SCEP through the, through the infrastructure bill and through uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is out on the streets in some form. And I think that that's just an amazing testament um, to DOE and to the, tech, and to the SCEP staff um, to, to bring these, to bring these uh, forward. Um, this fiscal year, we've obligated approximately $3.7 billion. And of the bill and the IRA funds, we've obligated approximately $4.5 billion. So significant movement in getting these funds out the door. And when we look at the IRA rebate programs, we, uh, we've just crossed our $2 billion threshold of funds that are obligated, and we have another $2 billion in the door that we're currently processing. So as you have seen, if you've paid attention to a lot of the news events, we are, the states are starting to launch their rebate programs, and we expect that momentum to continue throughout the year and in through 2025. We're going to take a little bit deeper dive into some of our programs here. We're going to take a little bit about our, our nonprofit program. So, you know, when we look at the nonprofit industry, we're talking approximately 1.5 million nonprofits in the United States employing almost 13 million individuals. 
So a large sector of our economy. They manage approximately a half a million facilities. And when you think about that, approximately 30% of their budget can go out the windows and through the roofs. So that's, that's their energy costs. A lot of these nonprofits have older buildings, older commercial spaces, and don't have the opportunity to invest in their facilities. And it's their largest, it's their second largest expense aside from staffing. So to, to, to put it in, at a ground level, you know, we are nonprofits, we're talking churches, we're talking food banks, we're talking a lot of, a lot of good groups doing good work. But if you think about food banks, the, the average stat is, is a dollar a meal. And if you think about energy savings, one dollar of energy savings equals one meal. $10,000 in energy savings equals 10,000 meals. $50,000 in energy savings equals 50,000 meals. The impact is real. Uh, energy bills matter. Um, they matter for, for in people's homes. They matter in nonprofits' bills. They matter in schools' bills, which we'll talk about in a little bit. When we look at our public schools, we have over 100,000 public schools in America. Over 50% require major upgrades. Uh, we're looking at approximately an $85 billion shortfall in facility upgrades. A huge, huge, huge demand, and we'll talk a little bit about that demand here in a little bit. Uh, this is a fun fact, but school facilities represent the second largest public infrastructure that we have. Traf it, it, it's highways and transportation, and it's public schools. So when you think about the public investment, the, the amount of funds that the schools have invested, the impact of, of schools, it, it, is, it is very, very impressive. Um, we have approximately, in 2022, we have over 13,000 public school districts um, and, yeah, over 100,000 in public schools. So a very, very big part. Um, we talked about how similar to nonprofits, this is the second largest expenditure in schools. Um, and when you look at school districts, collectively, they spend approximately $8 billion on energy. So if you can save 10%, if you can save 20%, if you can save 30%, those dollars add up, and that economic impact is very, very real. Um, when we think of the amount of time that people spend in schools, you know, the average, the average students and teachers spend over 1,000 hours in their schools. That's their environment. That's their working environment. If their working environment is 95 degrees, if their working environment doesn't have access to lots of um, well-ventilated air, it impacts their performance. Um, we know that, that, we know that, it, it, we know that heats, heat days are canceling schools. We know that uh, low-income schools are seeing impacts because um, they're, they're being forced to close, which is, again, furthering the, divi the, the learning division between high-income and low-income schools. Um, and when we think about the impact to the students, um, the number one cause of students missing school is asthma. So we think about indoor air quality and the importance to import indoor air quality the environment in which they're learning in makes a huge, huge difference. So to address these big, big issues, you know, Congress uh, passed the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law. It included um, funding for nonprofits. It included funding for school investments. So we have approximately $50 million to invest in our nonprofits. We have approximately $500 million to invest in our schools. And when we were talking about investing, we're talking about improving their energy efficiency. We're talking about improving that indoor air quality. We're talking about improving those HVACs, the air sealing, the insulation, the learning environment in which our students are constantly, constantly in. Um, so when we, we, we thank Congress for all, all of that work, and we are very happy that we're starting to roll out these funds and see results, and we have uh, a lovely school here that is actually taking advantage of that. Uh, so you can see the real world impact of these types of programs. Um, so when we keep going here, you know it, yeah, we'll keep going. Uh, let's just take a look at some of our nonprofit work. So our nonprofit work uh, here is that $50 million when we take a deeper dive in our nonprofit program. 
Um, that $50 million has actually been awarded to nine different organizations that will then sub-award it uh, to hundreds and hundreds of organizations as a whole. Um, so this sub-grantee will, uh, will lower barriers to entry and allow people to take advantage of this program. When we look at our schools program, we're seeing that we've invested, we've done two rounds of investment right now, $178 million resulting in 24 programs in 22 states. We've also done a second round of 21 winters investing in, 20, in, in $190 million of investment. And we're also providing technical capacity through our energy class prize award um, which is offering training on energy management. And I am a former energy manager, so I can tell you that having a well-qualified staff member results in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings. The demand for these programs are unprecedented. I want to stress this fact right here. I know I'm running short on time, but I really want to stress that in the first round, we had a over 1,000 schools apply. We could only reward 22. They applied for $1.6 billion in funding. In 2024, $1.3 billion applied. Over 2,000 schools applied. So we are showing unprecedented demand and need for these programs. The nonprofits saw the same thing um, and were do making real impact. So in our school system, we've impacted almost 200,000 students and over 14,000 teachers and over 300 nonprofits across the country. These programs, these awards, this legislation is making an impact. And for that, SCEP is very thankful. So with that, I would encourage people to keep their eyes on these programs, um, to find out more about these programs, uh, to can you continue to work with our state and community energy programs office. Um, and I will cede the, the floor and answer questions in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was great. These are such great programs. Uh, Renew America's nonprofits, uh, mercifully renamed from the Energy Efficiency Materials Pilot Program, which is what it's called in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, um, actually came out of, uh, on, the, on the Senate side, Senator Klobuchar and Senator Hovind's office uh, were actually the original sponsors of that. It's a great program. It's one that we've kind of taken a liking to at ESI, and uh, my colleague Miguel is here, and he particu in particular has put a lot of time in uh, an article series around that program and, and helping nonprofits understand the opportunities of energy efficiency. We'll talk about direct pay in a little bit, but we also have these out front. These are uh, the fact sheet um, that Miguel put together around direct pay. And so I encourage everyone to take a look at that and also visit us online to check out the rest of those articles about energy efficiency and nonprofits. That brings uh, us to our second panelist today, um, a recipient of one of the programs we were just talking about. Heather Meyer is uh, Director of Finance and Operations for Nottoway County Public Schools. Uh, Heather has experience, or expertise, I should say, in accounting and financial management. And since starting at Nottoway, she has put a focus on upgrading its aging schools. Nottoway County is an economically disadvantaged community, and Heather is very passionate about bringing energy savings to the school division in order to utilize those savings to fund instructional programs. Heather, congratulations on the grant. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation and learning a little bit more about it. And I'll advance the slide for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sorry, I might be a little nervous. I'm used to speaking in front of school boards, not, not, not audience such as, such as this. Um, but I am Heather Meyer. I'm in my fourth year as Director of Finance and Operations for Nottoway County Schools. Um, and in case anybody is wondering, Nottoway County is located about an hour southwest of Richmond, Virginia. Um, we are an economically disadvantaged community. Um, we, this was 2020 census data, we have a population of approximately 15,000 um, uh, house and uh, population. Um, median annual household is about 30,000. So obviously, we don't have households that earn a lot of income. We do not have a big tax base. Um, and our county is made up of three towns, um, Blackstone, Virginia, Burkeville, and Crewe. Um, Blackstone used to have an army base that closed back in the 90s. Um, Crewe at one point was a major hub for um, train um, traffic. Um, so it's gone away over the years and has definitely um, left us kind of 
feeling the hurt a little bit um, as far as being able to have the tax base to really keep up our schools and to be able to provide things for our um, students. Um, we do have a student population of 1,725 students, so we are a small, small school district. Um, we only have five schools. Um, we have two primary schools, which is pre-K through four. We have an intermediate school, which is grades five and six, middle seven through eight, and then our high school, um, obviously, is nine through 12. Um, primary funding sources for us, we are funded primarily from um, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, our county only provides us around close to 27% of our funding for our operations. Um, and that covers basically just the salaries for our teachers and the little bit of materials and supplies that we can, um, that we are able to provide for, for our teaching staff. Um, so I get asked a lot, why did we want to apply for the Renew America School grant? And I can tell you, our superintendent went to a conference. She learned about this. She brought it back. Um, and so I started looking into it. It's my first grant I've ever written um, or helped write. I didn't do all of it. Um, so I started trying to look for vendors who would help us because why well, we didn't have the capacity to do it all by ourselves. Um, so that was, that was quite a tedious process. But our biggest why are our students. Um, we do everything we do is for them. It's because of them. They are our driving force. Um, just going into the school, see their smiling faces. I mean, that's all, it, that's all we need to actually, you know, have that force to, to go forward. Um, for me, the other part of that is our aging buildings. Our... One of our schools was built in 1950. The last major renovation it had was 1972. Um, our primary schools were built in the 60s, the late 60s. Um, our newest building was our high school, it was built in 95. And up until last year, it still had some of its original HVAC units. It still has its original roof. Um, it has a lot of original parts and components from 1995, which are old and outdated. Um, the last renovations that we had to some of our schools were 2004 and 2007. And that was a roof. So there again, they have a lot of old, old components in them. Um, and a couple of our primary schools, we have sinks turned off because of lead pipes. Um, so there's, there's a lot of upgrades that need to be done. Our county just hasn't, unfortunately, had the, once again, the tax base to fund them. Um, so trying to find those alternative sources to be able to do some of this is very important for us. So we partnered with Train. Um, Train is one of our vendors. We also reached out to our um, electric co-op that's in, in our county and a couple of other vendors. Train was really the one that had the powerhouse behind them to really help us with the technical writing, um, with really just identifying the project. So we decided to utilize an ESCO for this. Um, one, it helps them come in as a GC for us to be able to manage the project because it's just me and I have a maintenance supervisor. So between the two of us and everything else we have, there's just not a lot of time for us to, to really be able to be on site every single day while construction's going on, this, that, and the other. Um, and Train has been a super big help for us. They came in, we sat down, we came up with a wish list of, of projects that we um, really wanted to tackle first, and then we narrowed them down to what was most important which, and what made the most sense. So going into the, the grant process, um, for us, as I said, you know, putting the list of potential projects together, um, we assigned duties between myself and Train as to who was going to do what um, so that we could try to do this quick turnaround time for the concept application because, I mean, you know, we're out for two weeks at Christmas, so that really gave us a week before Christmas break and about two and a half weeks after Christmas break um, to get that concept application written and edited and ready for, for submission. Um, and then even after we submitted that concept application, our work didn't stop. We continued to talk about the projects as if we were going to move into that second phase. Like, we really owned it. We, we you know, never thought about the what ifs of not, we just, we knew that this was gonna happen for us and we tried to keep that positive momentum. Um, and then we were notified that we could move forward to the full application. And that was super exciting for us. Um, there again, you know, working with Train just to get all those documents done, submitted, 
then, you know, it's waiting, waiting, waiting. I don't know how many emails I got from trainer phone. Call. Have you heard anything yet? Have you heard anything yet? No. But on June 29th, I think everybody in my office probably heard me um, yelling from my office when I saw the email when we were notified that we were one of the um, first selectees, which was really, really exciting. I said my first grant, and we won it, so I was super, super excited about that. Um, so for us, it was just, it, it was a blessing, um, and we continued to move forward with it. Um, going through the post-selectee process, you know, writing the SOPO, doing the budget justification, the NEPA determination, um, that was a huge win for us. Um, I think we were the first one that actually got NEPA determination, and learning how to do that, that was a chore, but we made it. Um, you know, a lot of other reports, and then we were into the waiting, waiting again for the actual award to come through, um, and we were on spring break when that came through, and once again, I was super, super excited when I saw that email. Um, and then after that, it was just hit the grounding, let's get started, let's get through it. And then BABA compliance kind of hits you, and you're like, okay, you think you got it, and then no, you don't. Then you think you got it, no, you don't. Um, so that's been a challenge for us, but we have worked through it. Um, I will say that the, the DOE staff has been amazing. Um, Dana has, has been a godsend for me and has been right there with me and answered any and every question I had. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and we're still working on a waiver for our HVAC units for budget period two. Um, and then tonight, construction finally for, begins for us. So it's super exciting. Um, our first part of our project, um, our building envelope work, they're going to start tonight with um, working on some insulation in our high school that has well, come apart, it's missing, so um, they're going to start working on that. So it's super exciting that we're finally seeing some projects start. Um, so what really does this grant mean to us? It means a lot. Um, it's a lot of projects that we're tackling. It's a lot of funding. Otherwise, we would still be adding Band-Aids on top of our equipment because, well, it's about all we could afford to do. Um, and it really gives us that momentum we need to start on this journey towards energy efficiency um, and better indoor air quality, because that is one of the things that I'm most passionate about is really trying to tackle the indoor air quality so that our students are not as sick as often and they're at school and that we can affect that chronic absenteeism that is just so prevalent everywhere. And we're really trying to utilize this to bring our students and our community together to show them what energy efficiency is and how it can be achieved even in their own homes. So just a few of the projects that we are working on. We have LED lighting going into all five of our schools. We are doing building envelope work at all five of our schools. Um, we have some HVAC replacements at our high school and our two primary schools. Um, we are putting in HVAC control systems in the schools that don't currently have them. We are um, doing some boiler replacements and an addition at a couple of our schools. New doors at our intermediate school and new windows there, which is amazing because that's 1950s. Um, desperately needs to be done. If you take one of those little fancy cameras, you can see where the air loss is. So this will be exciting for us. And then our high school is getting a new roof because they're the only school that so far has not gotten one. And that roof was from 1995, so it is old. Um, so project costs. We are receiving a little over $11.5 million in federal funds. Um, we are fronting um, a little over $600,000 um, in our cost share. And we are touching all five of our schools because that was what was important to us, that we wanted to make sure that we could affect all 1,725 of our students. Um, and our goal in this is a 25 to 45% estimated reduction in energy cost. And for us... Taking that, that savings and reinvesting it into um, other energy projects or into instructional projects is very important. The other thing that's very important for us is our student involvement. Um, we are going to be doing lunch and learn sessions with train and our students to highlight possible career paths. Um, we're going to be doing job shadowing, and they're going to be doing some student-led marketing campaigns about energy efficiency. We have our first meeting with our students next Friday. And then for us, future plans. Um, we want to continue to improve our energy efficiency 
indoor air quality. Um, we're going to be looking at adding uh, AQ monitors in all of our classrooms so we can really know what is going on in our classrooms. Um, additional HVAC replacements. We want to do some additional window and door replacements. Um, we know we've got a couple of other, uh, more roofs that are going to need to be redone in the next four to five years. Um, looking at potential solar projects to fund um, some of our um, energy. And then also kind of doing some research on some biophilia projects in our schools to kind of help with that indoor air quality and wellness. Um, so those are just some of our future plans. Um, I really thank you all for allowing me to speak today, and um, I'm very appreciative for this grant opportunity. That was great, Heather. That was an awesome presentation, and I like that you mentioned that you're one for one on your grants. But I also just had to, uh, you had to point out, like, you're tossing around these terms like a pro, SOPO, NEPA, BABA. Did you know what any of those were two years ago? Do you, are you happier now or then? <laughs> Good. Knowledge is power. Great. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these uh, capacity. Oh, thank you. Some of these capacity issues as we get a little bit long um, more into it. Um, Heather's presentation was awesome. Michael's presentation is awesome. We also have awesome presentations coming up. If you want to revisit any of those, um, all of the presentation materials will be posted online at www.esi.org. The webcast will also be posted, and in a couple weeks, we'll have some summary notes. We also keep in mind we'll have some time for questions. So if you're in our online audience, and I know there's a lot of you in our online audience today. You can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at ESI.org. And then, of course, we'll have questions from in the room as well. That brings us to Ian Goldsmith. Ian is a clean energy specialist with the U.S. Energy Program at the World Resources Institute. In this role, Ian supports the Elective Pay Lighthouse Cohort. This program directly supports local governments and other applicable entities as they work to maximize elective pay. Sometimes we call it direct pay, but I think it's the same thing and the other IRA incentives. Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much to ESI for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk to you all about direct pay. And I got a lot to say, so uh, let's get right into it. So uh, first off, I want to level set. What are we talking about when we say elective pay or direct pay? They are the same thing. Um, so previously, tax-exempt entities could not directly claim any tax credits. This makes sense if you don't have a tax liability. Generally, you wouldn't get any benefit from a tax credit or a tax deduction. However, what this meant is that there was a lot of incentives, uh, particularly climate and clean energy incentives, that were unavailable to uh, governments, to uh, subnational governments, to uh, subnational government instrumentalities, to nonprofits, and that hampered their ability to invest in things like renewable energy and things like electric vehicles. And so the Inflation Reduction Act, thank you, Congress, um, in 2022 introduced a new mechanism called elective pay or direct pay that allows these tax exempt entities to receive a set of clean energy and climate related tax credits as direct cash refunds from the IRS. This is the first time anything like this has ever been done and it applies to pretty much any tax exempt entity you can think of. So state, local and tribal governments, government instrumentalities, school districts, police, fire authorities, any section 501 tax exempt entity that includes 501c3 nonprofits, uh, universities, religious organizations, and public power utilities and rural electric cooperatives. So all of these entities and more now have access to this funding for their projects. So what exactly is covered by elective pay? Um, because uh, it, the Inflation Reduction Act only sets 12 new and expanded tax credits as eligible for this program. Um, and these run the gamut from, uh, you know, renewable energy to advanced manufacturing to hydrogen. But we've really seen six of these come out as the most relevant for most entities, particularly smaller entities. These are Section 30C, which is the Alternative Fuel Vehicle Refueling Property Credit. That's for electric vehicle charging as well as hydrogen refueling stations uh, in low-income and non-urban areas. 
There's Section 45W, which is the credit for qualified commercial clean vehicles. That applies to uh, electric vehicles as well as plug-in hybrids, um, running from small light-duty vehicles all the way up to electric school buses and municipal garbage trucks. And then finally, we have Sections 45 and 45Y and Sections 48 and 48E. Both of these tax credits cover clean and renewable energy technologies. Um, the production tax credit is based on how much energy a, uh, a facility produces. And the investment tax credit is based on the initial upfront costs of that installation. Um, but in general, what we're seeing is because of these tax credits, direct pay is supporting uh, renewable energy installations, clean vehicle purchases, and uh, clean vehicle refueling property. So uh, how do you get direct pay? What is the process for claiming elective pay? So to claim a tax credit through direct pay, entities must pre-register their projects and file a tax return with the IRS. Um, in a little more detail, uh, entities have to use an IRS portal. They have to upload their documentation and information about each project they want to claim a tax credit on, send that off to the IRS. The IRS will review those applications, review it for preliminary, preliminary eligibility, and then if it uh, deems it preliminarily eligible, it will issue it a unique ID number. Then the entity must use that ID number and put it on a 990T form, uh, as well as other supplemental forms to claim the tax credit. Um, like other tax filings, this happens once per year, um, and tax credits are claimed on projects completed in the previous fiscal year. If you can think of your personal tax returns where you filed in 2024 for all the salary or whatever you did in 2023. And returns are due four and a half months after the end of an entity's fiscal year. Uh, for a calendar year entity, this is May 15th, not April 15th. And for a July to June entity, that's November 15th. So kind of uh, just did a basic overview of what a direct pay is, how do you claim it, what does it cover? Now I want to go into why does this matter? What makes direct pay unique uh, and a really interesting, unique, innovative opportunity for our uh, nonprofits, for communities, for our municipalities? Firstly, direct pay is retroactive. A lot of people have called direct pay a rebate or a refund, even though it's technically not that, because in order to get it, you have to place a project in service. The project has to already be completed in order to file. Secondly, direct pay is stackable in with other sources of funding in a way that other uh, common sources are not. There's no categorical restrictions on claiming direct pay for projects uh, funded through grants, funded through loans, funded through unrestricted cash funds. There are specific rules that may reduce the amount that an individual entity receives, but in general, there are no categorical restrictions on using direct pay with other sources of funding. Direct pay is non-competitive and limitless. This is a big one. Unlike grants, unlike loans, there's no decision-making committee that's reviewing an application to see whether it meets strategic priorities. There's no pot of money that's going to run out um, uh, when, when you know, they've issued the grant to everybody. It's a tax credit. So as long as the entity does everything right, uh, fills out all the tax forms correctly, sends them off to the IRS, they will, will get the money back. And they'll get all that they're eligible for. It's limitless. There's no cap on how much money a elective pay entity can receive or how many tax credits they can play, that can claim. This is a big, big sea change from how many nonprofits and local governments operate in terms of grants and loans. It's a very different uh, uh, dynamic here. And then finally, adding to that, direct pay refunds are unrestricted. When an entity gets the money back, they can do whatever they want with it. They can choose to use it to the highest and best use that they see fit. Um, unlike a grant, unlike a loan, this is money that the IRS believes that the uh, entity is already entitled to. And so it's their money. They can do whatever they want. 
Um, it can go into a general fund. It can go into specific funds for future projects. It's really up to them. And so because of these reasons um, and uh, what we noticed was a need for folks to really get some help and understand this process, because again, this is the first time that anything like this has ever happened, the World Resources Institute um, partnered with other organizations, Lawyers for Good Government, Government Finance Officers Association, uh, Electrification Coalition, Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, and Urban Sustainability Directors Network to form the IRA Elective Pay Lighthouse Cohort. Uh, this is a collaborative effort to demonstrate the viability and utilization of IRA Elective Pay to help local governments uh, with their clean uh, energy and electrification projects. And we're directly supporting 60 plus cities with their lighthouse projects to use elective pay, particularly in this first year of uh, elective pay filing, so that uh, they can do so successfully and gain the confidence to uh, file for future projects and show the way for other interested but potentially hesitant entities to show that elective pay is real and that it can be a really huge benefit for nonprofits, for communities, for municipalities. And so we provide uh, um, technical assistance and guidance across this cohort of early adopter local governments. And so given that, you know, speaking to congressional staff today, wanted to share what uh, we're learning from this. What are the, you know, top things that are coming out as we're dealing with entities uh, Try navigating this program for the first time. So firstly, what we're seeing is that most local governments have never dealt with the IRS before. Um, local governments, as state governments, do not have to do tax returns, unlike nonprofits that have to do a tax-exempt return every year. So many local governments, when they hear about working with the IRS, which uh, they may have experience with from their personal taxes, uh, can be a little hesitant <laughs> uh, to do so. Um, and there's been, we've had to uh, put in work to make sure people feel comfortable with the fact that the IRS uh, is going to give them this money at the end of the day and that it's okay to work with them, that this is real, that it's okay to file these tax forms. Number two is that we, we've seen that strong internal department coordination is key to a successful filing. Um, uh, the internal uh, coordination, you know, you need, uh, local governments are, uh, have many different departments and they need to work together in order to actually file as a one entity. Three, various tax credit rules can complicate how much a local government receives. Um, because direct pay is a mechanism for receiving tax credits, each tax credit has its own rules. And so therefore, uh, you need to make sure that you're being compliant with those specific rules in addition to direct pay as a whole. Four, local governments are eager to plan projects around direct pay. Most local governments um, went into this first year not actually planning around this process. And so now that they are more aware of the opportunity, they're thinking about, okay, how can I maximize the benefit of elective pay in the future with my future projects doing so smartly? And then five, clear guidance, technical assistance, and product support are invaluable for communities navigating these processes for the first time. And when I say the first time, I really do mean the first time. Um, because of the way the filing works, uh, most entities will be receiving their first check in late 2024 or early 2025. And we expect that through this process, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in direct pay refunds will be going out for 2023 projects alone. And we're already seeing some of these uh, checks come out. This is from a nonprofit uh, out in San Francisco called Revolve. Um, and uh, I know I'm getting up on my time, but I really wanna highlight um, that we're seeing some success stories. I wanna highlight Pateros, Washington. They're a town of 700 people um, outside in rural central Washington. And they're actually one of our lighthouse cities. We work uh, to help them file uh, in August. And so Pateros, we, we like to say if Pateros can do it, you know, anybody can do it. Anybody can get the uh, benefits of elective pay. And so um, I mentioned about technical assistance uh, and, and the support that we're providing through Lighthouse. One of the other avenues um, that our partner, Alpha GG, is pursuing to help 
technical assistance is creating tools so folks can uh, think about elective pay eligibility on their own. And so I'm going to uh, turn it back over and we're gonna hear uh, from Jillian Blanchard, the director of the climate change program at Lawyers for Good Government and a great partner of uh, ours in the Lighthouse cohort about this tool. So yeah, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. And thank you, Ian, for going over the power of elective pay, what it means, and some of the issues that can crop up when tax exempts try and apply for tax credits. Uh, that is, in fact, why I'm here to talk to you today about the Clean Energy Tax Navigators, one of the solutions that we've built as a tool to help people file for elective pay. So I'm Jillian Blanchard. I am the director of the Climate Change and Environmental Justice Program at Lawyers for Good Government, which is a national nonprofit that has a pro bono network of over 120,000 legal advocates in all 50 states. And we use lawyers in ways that make a difference. So for the past two years, we've been very, very focused on providing both legal services at the high level, as well as direct services around the equitable implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act in particular, helping people file for elective pay and to access this powerful new tool. So we've worked with state governor's offices. We've worked with Ian and World Resources Institute in the Lighthouse cohort, assisting 60 cities filing for elective pay. We work with communities. We work with rural co-ops as well as school districts and tribal governments. And through that process, we have learned a lot and built up a lot of resources around how to file for elective pay because taxes are hard for tax exempts, but they don't have to be. And so the, that is how and why we built the Clean Energy Tax Navigator, which is our attempt to build a one-stop shop for all of the resources we've put together to make it as easy as possible for any applicable entity to learn about eligibility and to file for elective pay. What the Navigator does is it addresses six of the most common credits that are available under elective pay that we are seeing being used by the public sector. So it, it offers information on electric vehicle purchases, on a, electric vehicle infrastructure projects, as well as all of those clean energy technologies under wind, solar, geothermal, and storage that fall under the investment tax credit or the production tax credit. And we offer on the back end, one-on-one uh, -on -one technical assistance and support with our pro bono attorney network for any of those entities that don't get their questions answered into the navigator, and need some additional assistance and meet our rubric of need and project impact. So I wanna go through a very quick demo of how the Clean Energy Tax Navigator works so that you can be comfortable with it and share it with your constituents who may be struggling with filing for elective pay. So the example project I've, we're using here is a city that's placed an electric vehicle infrastructure project in service in 2023. This is the homepage that you're going to see for the Clean Energy Tax Navigator. You'll see you have these three channels. You're going to have the electric vehicle infrastructure right in the center there, but you also have your solar, wind, and geothermal option or electric vehicle purchases option. So we're going to click the center channel. Then the Navigator wants to know your name, your information, your project title. That's how it tracks your project and your submission. And then it wants to know information about the entity that's filing for elective pay. So here it's a local government but it also wants to know where you fall on the spectrum of knowledge around how to use direct pay. So if, for example, if you said, I have no idea what direct pay is and click A, the navigator would pop up resources to help you learn more about direct pay. In fact, there's a handy orange link there at the bottom that if you clicked it would open a new tab with lots of resources just to get familiar with direct pay, but it wouldn't lose your place in the navigator. That tab would still be open and you can keep moving through the process. And now it wants to know like what types of services do you need help with? So, and it asks you this because it provides resources on the right based on your answers. So if you were to click any of the first three uh, boxes, what you'd see is an option to go straight to filing, uh, the filing process. For example, the first three boxes give you uh, our request for information about the filing process. And so you see down here an orange link that you could click on if you wanted to skip eligibility because you knew your project was eligible and you could get straight to direct pay filing guidance. And in fact, we even have annotated tax forms that we built with our friends at World Resources Institute and the Lighthouse cohort to help people file for elective pay. 
back to the navigator. Let's say you want to learn more about eligibility or these pesky bonus adders that are complicated. You would click on the bonus adders and it would pop up because the navigator knows that for electric vehicle infrastructure projects, the only eligible bonus adder is prevailing wage and apprenticeship. So it gives you a fact sheet right there to figure out what those requirements are and how you might comply. Because one of the very next questions is going to be, do you comply with those requirements in order to get the full elective pay 30% back? And you have to read the requirements, come back and answer the question correctly. And if you click yes, the navigator will tell you, great, you're actually eligible for 30%. And it's gonna move through the process of asking you when your project was placed in service and give you guidance on how to make that determination. It wants to know whether you own your project because that affects your elective pay uh, eligibility. It wants to know another question related to eligibility for electric vehicle infrastructure as to whether or not you're in a low income or non-urban area. And it gives you a link to the Department of Energy map that the Department of Energy put together that's incredibly helpful that tells you whether or not your project is in a low income or non-urban area. So if you were to click yes, the navigator would say, congratulations, you are eligible for 30% elective pay. And then you're gonna move through the process and ask any additional questions you might have so that we can help you on the back end with some additional technical assistance if necessary. It's also gonna ask about your project impact so that we can track some of these benefits that are happening as a result of the inflation reduction. And if you get to the end, you click next, and confetti will fall from the sky and you'll be told your project is eligible at, for elective pay. And then you have an opportunity to just get more information. You could get information from the Atlas Project Finance Hub on how to pay for projects upfront. You can get information about elective pay filing, that page I showed you earlier. You can add a new project and go through the process again for a new project, or you could just go back and get more information on elective pay. So that's the navigator in a nutshell. We want you to share it far and wide. It is free for anyone to use. It is geared towards public sector and, and applicable entities. Um, and it's just the cleanenergytaxnavigator.org. So if you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out, Jillian at l4gg.org. And Sterling Howard will be in the room with you today if you have any questions about the Navigator. Thanks so much. That was great. That is such a cool tool. It is so complicated. I know in our outreach to nonprofits, they're like, how do we do this? It's like, I don't know. Like, you know, this is tax advice starts to get pretty complicated. And also, uh, my guess is that over time, developers and companies like Train will get good at how to figure out all of this stuff. But it takes a little bit of time. And, you know, no one wants to go first, but also no one wants to go last. So great uh, presentation, Ian and Jillian. Thank you very much. That brings us to Robin Lewis, our fourth, or I guess fourth panelist, but fifth speaker today. Robin is the Director for Climate Equity at Interfaith Power and Light uh, DMV, so for the uh, uh, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Robin believes that she has been called as a Christian to be a voice for environmental justice and equity in her community. After working in business for a long time, Robin found satisfaction in helping educate others, in particular black, brown, and underserved communities, to engage and advocate for environmental policies that promote justice, well-being, and a better quality of life. As a result, Robin shifted her career focus to community engagement to help promote collaboration on environmental justice and equity issues. In her current role at IPL uh, DMV, Robin facilitates beloved DMV Environmental Justice Collective for black church leaders, Robin, thank you very, very much for being here today. I'll turn the lectern over to you and I'm gonna enjoy your presentation. Now I'm kind of short, so I'm gonna to have to stay on my tippy toes. I think, can you see that? Is that good? Okay, can you see me? Okay, cool. Um, hi everybody. So, I am going to talk today a little bit about what faith communities see and how they use IRA. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Interfaith Power and Light. So Interfaith Power and Light, D.C., Maryland, Northern Virginia, is a local affiliate of Interfaith Power and Light, which is a national organization. Um, we work with hundreds of congregations across the region, what we call DMV, not Division of Motor Vehicle, that's D.C., Maryland, Northern Virginia. Um, so we work with hundreds of congregations across the, the region, and we help them 
look at climate and look at other issues around the environment uh, differently and how, they, how we can respond to this climate crisis. Um, we help educate, um, help them go green, and we help them advocate. We, we pull them into the advocacy part of, of the work. So as I mentioned, we educate, we advocate. So those are our main uh, things that we do. We also help implement. So some of the things that we're working on, and these are just very few. We, we have a small team. It's about six or seven of us now, I think. And, um, you know, we're probably going to add because we're tapped. <laughs> As you can imagine, we're tapped out. We deal with, there's over 800 congregations that we've dealt with in our, in our database and hundreds of people, faith leaders. So we, we have a program called Solar Shepherds in which we provide technical assistance um, to congregations. Um, for example, and, and I mentioned it, it low, down lower, um, for example, benchmarking. Um, in D.C. and Montgomery County, there's benchmarking requirements of buildings over a certain size, and those include houses of worship. A lot of those houses of worship, they, you know, don't understand the requirements or the portal or other things, so we actually help those congregations. We provide technical assistance and help them um, become compliant because some of them aren't, and the laws aren't, they, they're not forgiving sometimes. Um, so we have a Solar Shepherd program in which we also help congregations who are thinking about going solar or thinking about um, EV charging stations or solar battery backup. We, we help to, um, be, as a nonprofit, we, we, we don't have a profit motive. So we're trying to help them and we're trying to navigate based on their needs. Um, and we, we don't necessarily recommend um, for profit agencies to help them, but we, we provide them with lists of different agencies that may have worked with other nonprofits or other congregations. So, so we try to be as supportive and, and I wouldn't say neutral because our client is the congregation in the house of worship. So we are trying to help enable them to get their needs met. Um, we help them with green ministries, and I focus on environmental justice since my focus um, is on the black church. I focus on issues around not just air quality, water, land, but housing, uh, green jobs, food justice. So to me, environmental justice is all-encompassing. Um, so we have a native plant um, program. We're working with the National Wildlife Federation um, called Sacred Grounds, in which we help congregations um, build out their, their grounds and uh, put native plants um, so we can have pollinators. Um, we also uh, work on uh, community science. Um, we're doing some air quality monitoring. We're putting monitors with the University of Maryland um, in at houses of worship across the region so we can measure air. And we also um, have a kitchen testing, kitchen gas testing. So we have monitors. We go into people's homes um, and we test and show them what the indoor air quality is based because of their gas stove, um, which we... Um, of course, are advocating for electrification. And that's where our advocacy comes in. Um, just connecting um, the community to advocacy through education. So that's what we do. We, we try to show, we don't tell people we're doing anything to them or banning. We don't do that. What we do is show them the data, show them what's happening, allow people and congregations to make their own decision about their community. That is what environmental justice is about. It's about self-determination and sovereignty. And so we stand on those principles in the work we do. And we're also working on the Eastern Shore um, with other IPLs along the shore on climate resiliency, looking at what's going on out in uh, the eastern shore area of sea level rise, because that's happening. 
So we have a, a project with NOAA um, in which we're working out there with uh, congregations on the Eastern Shore. So we have a lot of things that we're working on. Um, and solar, we've been doing solar collection of information forever. You see the little dots. Well, there's over 150 congregations in the region that have solar already. Um, so this was before direct pay. So a lot of them have either lease or power purchase agreements in which they work together with a, a, a possibly a for-profit agency to um, help them put solar on their roof. Now we have, of course, a new option, which is direct pay. So what direct pay is doing for us in, in the faith community is giving us more options. It's getting people more excited. It's getting agencies to want to do power purchase agreements in a different way. And we also uh, have new, now we have green banks, right, that are coming out with new creative ways of looking at solar and making sure it kind of works together. So um, I don't have to tell you about direct pay. You already know about that and all of the things that it supports. Um, additionally, in, in, in addition to the 30% that standards, there are bonuses. And depending on where your congregation is, you can have additional 20, 30% bonus. It depends on what, how you do your system. So um, we're, we are talking with congregations about community solar. We're talking with con congregations about rooftop canopy solar, putting canopy on top of their parking lot. There's some exciting things, and this is what this has done for us. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, also, the state and local rebates. Um, we are insisting, especially in Maryland and D.C., um, that low and moderate income residents are prioritized. I understand Justice 40, but we're trying to, for <laughs> we're trying to make sure, okay? <laughs> so we are, we're in, in the faces of our legislators and saying, okay, and of those that are administrating the funds and saying, okay, we need to prioritize these um, low and moderate income communities um, over anyone else. So those are the kinds of things. And I think um, in Maryland, um, we have a lot of things going on. Maryland is really exciting, and D.C. as well. Um, and there's also some environmental justice, thriving communities, technical assistance. I, it, forget all of that. Tic Tacs, okay, that's what we call them, the Tic Tacs. And they are to help us or help the Houses of Worship with the technical aspects of applying for these grants and for these other things. Um, the challenge right now is the capacity of the Tic Tacs. They just started. So a lot of them uh, need help. And we, IPL, we've been helping um, with them, with our solar shepherds. But of course, at capacity is needed. So that's the challenge with Tic Tacs right now. Um, the, the intent is great and wonderful, but until they build up capacity, the faith communities are, you know, have to go somewhere. So we're trying to help fill in the gap um, with regard to that. Also, of course, and all of these are IRA-funded programs. Um, uh, the Climate Core Fellowship uh, Program for Youth, we just were, we, we have one um, person who is working with us, and he's awesome. We just started. Um, and these are young, young people who um, are being funded through, the, through IRA to, to learn about climate and work with organizations like ours um, to move forward in this space. So um, IRA funding opportunities for faith communities, we, the Community Change Grant. So we, IPL, is working with um, uh, Bowie State and some others um, to apply for the Community Change Grant. Um, we're hoping to enhance the programs that we currently have. We're not trying to start anything new. We already do a lot. So we're trying to enhance the Native Plant Program, the BEPS Support Program, um, Beyond Gas, which is testing, uh, kitchen testing. Um, Region 3, we also, um, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, they are um, doing some gr using the grants to, to help organizations like ours help congregation. So we're going to apply to some of these grants. And of course, we work very closely with the green uh, banks, uh, the green banks. Um, we have a few in Maryland and of course, D.C. Um, and Solar for All, we were selected as a, as a partner in D.C. 
um, for solar for all, which hopefully as it, it gets implemented, 50% savings for low and moderate income residents. So I know I got to wrap up. So let me quickly go through this. Um, so there's some innovative things going on with state and local where they're combining IRA money and, you know, like the Empower Maryland program and the rebates. They're looking to combine these things. And I think that's exciting. And that's what we really hope to do um, as we push advocacy and push these agencies to look at taking all of these and putting them together and helping the community. Um, two examples, uh, Beth Shalom, uh, which is a congregation in Frederick, they just completed their solar, so they just did um, pre-filing, um, and uh, they, they, will, they will get their money next year. Um, and Falston, UMC, United Methodist, um, they had some snags because of the um, pre-filing, and they pre-filed, but the 990T, there's some, some, some things in the system you know, that the IRS has to probably, you know, make sure, um, connect, okay? So um, that's, that's some of the challenges, and these are just two examples of owners uh, using direct pay. So I think that's it. Yep, that is. Thanks so much. We didn't talk much about Delaware. I don't know why I said Delaware. I don't, never think of Delaware. It's District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. <laughs> Delaware doesn't, I mean, no offense to Delaware, but, you know. Okay. Yeah. Cool. They're fine. Yeah. You talked about the Eastern yeah, Shore, right? Delmarva, yeah. that's yeah. fine. No Actually, we're probably going to do something with Delaware. Good, then DDMV, Delaware. but for now it's DMV. <laughs> Sorry about that. No offense to the district. Um, all right, well, we are going to transition into our question and answer period, and we have a little bit of a special treat today. Let me um, advance the slide so we don't have anything. Um, one of our policy interns, Jemiah Barnett, is with us today. And Jemiah asked if she could participate in the briefing today. And so we decided that we would let her kick off the questions today. So Jemiah, I'll introduce you to the lectern, or um, welcome you to the lectern, and you can help us get started with our Q&A today. Thanks, Jemiah. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's start this Q&A off with this question. Um, what steps are agencies taking to help local governments and nonprofits with less capacity or technical expertise access grant programs and direct pay? I'll start off with Michael. Yeah, so thank you very much. Really appreciate the question. Um, we know capacity is an issue. Uh, there's there's no, no question about that. We hear from our stakeholders. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, point out that we have some examples of capacity building right here. Um, you know, with Interface and Power and Light, with uh, WRI, we have philanthropy stepping in to fill this goal. We also have the uh, uh, private market stepping in to fill this goal as well. Um, you know, you worked with Train to help step in and help build capacity and provide technical expertise. So there's a, a, a public element, there's a private element, and of course there is a governmental element. Um, so we at, at DOE, like I said, we recognize that this is a huge issue. One of the things, one of our big initiatives is, is standing up the Office of Community Engagement, um, which, which really works with communities um, to help bring, to, na to help them navigate DOE and the federal government as, as a whole. Um, you know, every program thinks that, 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 that they're, they're, they're responsive and they're, they're able to answer questions and, and all of these wonderful things. And, and Truly, they, they try their best, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big door to open. And so OCE really is that front door to DOE, so people can knock on it. Um, we have regional representatives all across the country um, and help them if they have an idea, if they have questions about a grant, to help them navigate that whole process. We're also funding, uh, you brought up the Community Energy Fellows, um, DOE is funding approximately 20 to 20 to 35 fellows um, that get placed in uh, organizations and communities uh, to help them bring forward these projects. I actually had a great opportunity to meet um, with our fellow. I was down in Phoenix um, for Arizona's rebate launch. Um, I got to meet with their, their fellow, but what was that fellow was doing is he wasn't just helping Phoenix. He was helping the surrounding town, the smaller towns, with their EECBG programs as well. So it's expanding the reach of the of 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 Phoenix and increasing inter intergovernment cooperation um, to take advantage of these programs. 
Um, finally, we also offer a significant amount of technical assistance to communities as well. You know, you brought up energy performance contracting. Just as an example, DOE runs an energy performance contracting cohort to help people navigate that process. We also maintain a significant amount of technical um, contracting assistance and guidance documents through our state and local solution center as well as a very basic entry point for people that are research, researching new topics. So, you know, I'm not going to pretend that we've got this all figured out, but I will say that we've made significant steps and progress to make sure that we're providing opportunities to engage with communities so they, they really can take advantage of our programs. Um, so one of the things that I have been blessed to kind of help with um, is help other selectees kind of post being, going through their SOPO, their budget justification, being able to them um, because I think it's important to not just hoard that, that knowledge, but to be able to impart that. Um, but just within our own com community, trying to really make sure that, you know, our, our poor families, our economically disadvantaged families, um, really know what's out there for them. We've been partnering with the Community Housing Partnership Group to, to bring awareness to our, um, especially our elderly population, that there's programs out there to help them put um, insulation in their homes to help lower their bills. Um, so really trying to do multiple things to just get the word out, to get the the, the message out that there are programs to help people and that there are people who are willing to help um, navigate those programs, I think it's extremely important. Yeah, I would um, say, you know, as uh, a part of uh, a technical assistance program that's working to help folks specifically with direct pay, you know, the nonprofit world, I think a lot of folks from there are, are recognizing the opportunity and uh, are actively looking to and working with uh, municipalities, other nonprofits, um, you know, uh, eligible entities to make sure that with direct pay, they, that communities understand uh, what the opportunity is, understand the process, um, which can be one of the biggest barriers uh, to accessing this, um, and understanding how they can operationalize direct pay in the future. Um, for projects moving forward. One, the, um, uh, I mentioned our Lighthouse cohort. The reason why it's called the Lighthouse cohort is because we, uh, we envision it, as, we envision the cities as leaders, as lighthouses, paving the way, showing the way for other communities, um, saying, hey, that this, this program is real, that we can use it, that uh, we got it for ours, or ours, let us show you how uh, we you can use direct pay uh, for your projects. So yeah, we want to. Uh, I think we want to see our work, our technical assistance, have knock on effects, and um, you know, expand from just what we are able to do ourselves. So just to add a little bit, some of the other areas that, in addition to doing technical uh, support uh, for BEPS and other things in terms of solar. Um, we're also working with um, uh, DC Water um, with the lead service pipe replacements, trying to help them host um, community or you know um, community meet <coughs> meetings along with other grassroots EJ organizations, um, but hosting them at congregations. Um, we're also going to be working. Um, in hopefully in Baltimore and other places um, with organizations like Young G Gifted and Green um, and you know uh, other organizations, grassroots organizations that are focused on lead prevention. Um, so um, and that's through the Infrastructure um, Act, you know. So that's funding through that. Um, but hopefully we'll we'll expand, you know, that education. Um, because communities uh, need to, to know. And we can use uh, congregations and houses of worship to expand that reach um, because a lot of people do connect with a, a house of worship. So that's kind of some of the things we're doing in partnership with um, agencies. 
Thank you. end up here and let everyone else do the talking all the time, is it? <laughs> it's hard work. Thank you, Jemiah. That was awesome. Um, it sounds like when I was, I was listening to your answers, and it's fun to listen to it from down there, is once you make a little bit of this technical assistance available, right, people are hungry for it. Um, and I liked what Michael was saying, and I know um, Gretchen and Annabelle and others at SCEP have done a really nice job leveraging some limited resources to technical assistance to really get to, you know, many, many more uh, organizations that, um, that really need it. Um, I have a couple questions from our online audience, but I'm happy to, um, Jemiah's now shifted to roving microphone duty. So if there are questions, it looks like there is a question in the back. Happy to let you go. And um, uh, yeah, and, but we have, we have plenty of time for, hopefully we'll get to everyone. So I uh, appreciate the, uh, the briefing today, really helpful. Um, as you know, uh, for projects construction of which begin uh, either this year, next year, or thereafter, uh, we have this pesky problem of domestic content. Right? To, to claim elected like pay, you must have domestic content or qualify for one of the waivers. Uh, the, uh, the rules for meeting domestic content are extremely Byzantine and challenging. Uh, the waivers, there are no rules yet. So how are, you, how are you advising your clients, your customers, the people you're with, uh, how to meet those guidelines? Do you have uh, paper available to explain sort of what hoops they need to jump through so they have the certainty today to know that they will meet those requirements when they when they go to file later. Thanks for the question. Ian, maybe it makes sense to start with you, but we'll give everyone a chance to chime in if they'd like. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for the question. So um, just for, for context, because I uh, didn't mention it. So um, for uh, under the renewable energy projects, um, there is a requirement for uh, elective pay claimers to um, use a certain percentage of domestically sourced content in those projects. Um, I think on our side, so, so our partners L4GG have uh, released a fact sheet um, explaining what those rules are, putting them in uh, more understandable uh, plain English for uh, folks that are maybe affected by it. Um, on our side, we've seen a lot of local governments and um, communities are actually not directly impacted by this because uh, there that the domestic content threat uh, rule only applies for projects over one megawatt in capacity, and one megawatt is a is a fairly large amount if you're talking for an individual uh, faith institution, an individual nonprofit, an individual. Um, you know, community uh, doing something. But it is an issue, um, and it's something that I think folks will need, uh, you know, clear guidance on. I know IRS has started to put out guidance on this, um, and I think that uh, may be a role for, you know, um, nonprofits as well as uh, uh, potentially consultants in the future to help with this particular problem. Um, any other folks on the panel? Like to weigh in on that one? Um, uh, sure, Jemiah, could you bring the mic over real quick? Thank you. That'd be great, thanks. In case it's helpful, the fact sheet's available at l4gg.org forward slash direct pay. That's where you'll find all of our resources, fact sheets about bonus adders, all the domestic content, prevailing wage, all the fun, fun stuff. Great, thanks. Um, great, thanks for... Um, I'm going to take this one from um, the online audience and we'll open it up to everyone. But maybe, Robin, maybe we could start with you and maybe work backwards. I think you have something to say. And that is, from your, from your perspective, how could the programs, the programs, incentives, and investments that we've been talking about, how could they improve if there would be a round two? Are there ways that we could make these sorts of things more accessible for communities um, that would help you know, maybe minimize some of the need for extra technical assistance or maybe reduce some of the, the burdens of, you know, how do I find your, this, figure this stuff out to begin with? Well, the, the challenge is capacity because they, I think the houses of worship, a lot of them are small. I mean, they're not all huge mega churches. Um, I think, you know, having, having boots on the ground, having people in the community or access to um, people to help. For example, 
um, some of the grants. The grant writing is not easy, and if and it's not just grant writing, it's compliance um, after you you are awarded the the grant. We were talking about that, so so I think you know having more support, having um, uh, you know more transparency about where organizations like mine and other organizations can tap so that we can help um, congregations because you can't expect, I don't think, um, houses of worship to be in this stuff, in this space, you know, um, and know all the details and know where to go and know how to navigate that. So so having, you know, more capacity for organizations like the Tic Tac organizations and those and, and, and giving the those those organizations, the capacity to help. Um, I think that's probably because we're talking about grants and it's money and it has to be properly reported and channeled and all of that other stuff. Um, and t in order to get the money out to communities, um, some more education and outreach. Um, outreach is the last thing people want to pay for. And that's the most important thing, um, you know, working like with DC Water and us going out into the community, engaging our, our organization to actually pull in people so they know what's going on because it, 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 they can get their service lines replaced, but they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, the key to me. The key is more um, connection with the community and more education and outreach, I think. Um, Ian, and then we'll uh, hear from Heather and Michael as well. Yeah, I think uh, really seconding the capacity piece. Many, you know, um, from a direct pay standpoint, the entities that are most likely to file for them tend to be under-resourced. They tend to be nonprofits, local governments that may not have a lot of people or may have, or, you know, maybe strapped for uh, capacity to deal with entirely new programs, deal with thing, uh, tax forms, deal with the IRS. And I think um, expanding the outreach as well as, you know, uh, support from, you know, the uh, technical support through the IRS, um, I think, you know, would be very helpful, um, you know, specifically for direct pay. I think another thing that we've seen with uh, elective pay is that many um, local governments, state governments are uh, focused on a lot of energy efficiency measures. And because direct pay is simply a mechanism for accessing existing tax credits, and none of those existing tax credits really cover electric, uh, energy efficiency measures or cover only a couple energy efficiency measures, um, a lot of things that sustainability directors that folks want to do that are more actionable in their community are unfortunately not covered by direct pay. It allows them to think uh, bigger and more ambitious about renewable energy, about EV charging, but some of this more um, bread, and, bread and butter stuff um, and the small things that can make a really big difference at a local level, unfortunately, direct pay has trouble covering. Um, speaking of big differences at local levels, Heather, do you have any thoughts about maybe what could have been a little bit easier if you had the opportunity to do this again? Well, um, I definitely think that, that, you know, just the process itself was very cumbersome. It was very time consuming. I mean, I was very blessed that I had an amazing teaming partner to, to work with. I know not every selectee or awardee has had that, um, but I really... You know, big shout out to the Department of Energy. They've really taken feedback and, you know, they're constantly bringing additional information to us to help us. And that has been an amazing resource. I mean, I think the first call we were on, they were, you know, we're learning right along with you. Um, so it was a very humbling process. So a big shout out to them just for helping build our capacity. Um, I mean, that, that, that was an amazing experience and, and that I appreciate. And Michael, now that your ears are burning. Well, I mean, you're, you're highlighting a feedback loop, right? Yeah. You know, that's what's so great about this process. That's what's so great about, you know, you know the, the, the expression building the airplane while you're flying it is that you have an opportunity to receive feedback and try and address that in real time. You know, our, our, and we at SCEP are very adamant about trying to meet our, our grantees, our applicants, those that are asking for technical assistance where they are um, and try to adjust 
as best we can. Thank you very much, Annabelle, for all your work on that. Um, but if I was to look at, our, you know, if I'm to look at a round two, I would, you know, I would, would really like to think that we, we think about in, in broad levels, accessibility. How are people accessing these funds? Um, are we writing legislation so that it is determined to be accessible? Um, I would look at flexibility. Um, are we unintentionally um, handcuffing or directing funds towards or having unintended consequences? Um, these are, you know, some of just some very key and basic things that at the end of the day, we as an agency get a couple of pages of legislation and ultimately need to turn it into a full-fledged program. And so how that is written, how that flexibility, how that accessibility, how those stakeholders are engaged in the creation of that process, are we listening to them, are we going out, are we receiving that feedback? Those are all very important questions in this process. Um, and so because at the end of the day, we as an agency ultimately implement um, what, what, what is passed by Congress. And so making sure that as that, that is, you know, as, 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 as those conversations are taking place, we're focusing on accessibility and flexibility. Um, we have time for one more question if there's anyone from the audience. Um, I'll look around. Oh, great. Hi there. I um, uh, just wanted to, I'm Joe McGarvey with Senator Hirono, and um, Ms. Meyer just wanted to say thank you for coming um, all the way here from Nottaway. And you just mentioned, um, you know, some of the energy savings that you were, you know, hoping to see, and obviously recognizing that a lot of the improvements that you're talking about, you know, you can't easily measure on your power bill, you know, like air quality improvements for the students. Um, but I guess w what you know, what is your normal kind of energy costs and what, what is the, the savings you're, you're seeing or you're hoping to see with these projects? Thank you. Well, so since we are a small division, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, so larger divisions, I mean, our average cost every year is about 250000 just in electric bills. Um, and really what we're hoping to see is, is about... Um, anywhere between a 25 to a 45 percent decrease, and that's just depending upon school. Um, we know some schools are going to see more or less, um, but really hoping that, especially with the LED lighting and just sealing up of our buildings where air is escaping. We don't want to air condition the outside. We don't want to heat the outside. Like we want to do that inside. Um, we're really hoping um, that just looking at our utility bills, that we will see a pretty significant decrease within the first couple of months. Um, but we want to continue to track that. Um, and then we're hoping that as we, you know, build in those um, indoor air quality monitors, that we can then really see what else do we need to address um, so that we can make our HVAC systems more efficient um, and make our just our building air quality that much better. Um, so it's, it's a multi-level, you know, process for us um, just to, to work through this and, and see how this goes. We've already started building some of the um, measuring modules with TRAIN as to how um, they're going to help us track all of this. Thanks for the question. Are, are you using Portfolio Manager from Energy Star? Is that something that you've been about tracking your, your data? Um, we've been using TRAIN's system okay. currently to track our data. Um, that's been a big help because we didn't, you know, we're just utilizing what they have. Um, so we haven't gone out and branched further okay. than that. Great. Um, they're not on the panel today, but EPA Energy Star has tremendous resources, especially for congregations and small businesses. So um, just wanted to, I have a feeling they're in our online audience today. So I just wanted to give them a plug. Um, I think your energy savings is probably a great place to end today. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to our panelists and to Jillian. Uh, for uh, being with us today. Thank you very much for your great presentations. Um, I'd also like to once again say thanks to Senator Welch and his great team uh, for help with the room today. Um, SCEP has gotten a lot of love uh, today, but I'd really like to say thanks to our partners at SCEP, uh, Annabelle and Gretchen in particular, for all of your help and being great partners as we understand these programs and help get the word out and help educate Capitol Hill about the great stuff that, uh, that you all are doing with the, with the incentives and the, the programs that they've created. So thank you very much.
Um, I'd also like to thank, say thanks to my colleagues, uh, Dan O, uh, Omri, who's actually on vacation this week. I don't know why we keep proving these vacations. Uh, Allison, Anna, Molly, and Nicole. Miguel is also with us. He's not always at our briefings, but Miguel, thanks for being here as well. Um, we have also have three tremendous uh, interns this semester. You've already met Jemiah. Thank you, Jemiah, for being a great questioner. But we also have Joshua, who's been helping us with our timekeeping, and Alia, helping us with the photos. And I don't know what that sound was, but it looked like it might have been coming from you. So, um, But no, seriously, thanks so much for being great interns. Uh, Troy, our videographer, is in the back of the room. Thank you very much for all of your help as well. Uh, we will be back on October 8th with the Mississippi River. That's our first stop in our Resilient and Healthy River Community Series. There'll be lunch. Don't miss it. Um, and then after that, we will uh, turn our attention very quickly to Coptober. Uh, all of three of our briefings will be online. They'll be back-to-back -back on October 23rd, 24th, and 25th. You can sign up for everything at esi.org, and you should, uh, should, in fact, sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. This, again, is just a survey link if you have two minutes or less uh, to take our survey and let us know what you thought. If you're in our online audience, if you had any audio issues or video issues, or if you have any ideas for future briefings, we really do read every response. And sorry I wasn't able to get, all of our, get to all of our online questions today, but thanks for those coming in. We'll wrap it up a minute or two behind schedule, but we'll see everybody back here on October 8th. And thanks again, panelists, for doing such a great job. Thank you.